All right, so now we want to proceed into the modeling stage and the ultimate question we want to answer is, you give me a certain structure, um, if I can predict the number of cycles to failure um, in terms of crack growth that that structure will experience, for a given safety factor, I can tell you when the, um, when the service should be done. Now, to answer that question, it turns out, we need to answer a slightly different question. And that question is based on the graph that I have already drawn before. Um, so we have the number of cycles and we have the size of the crack. And we know that the crack will, starting from an initial size, it will grow and it will do so at an ever increasing rate dA dn. Okay. So dA dn is the crack growth rate and um, we know that it increases with increasing number of cycles. Now um, of course if I have this line then I don't need any model. Um, so what I can do is simply, well, you, I am interested in now the following question. You start and you cycle the material through so many cycles and initially this was the size of the crack and I am interested in the final size of the crack. So I've cycled that much, I go up to the red line and I can um, tell you what the new size of the crack is. But eventually um, what I would like to uh, do is I'd like to do that prediction based on a model. So in other words, I'd like to really not think that I have that red line, ex at least explicitly, and I would like to have a model that is able to tell me, well, I start and I cycle through so many right uh, cycles. This was the initial size of the crack. And through the model, I will be able to tell you where eventually uh, the new size of the crack lies along that axis, right? So if you have experimental data, then you just go shoot up to that point and find the new size of the crack. But I want to be able to do that with a model. You give me the change in the number of cycles. I give you the change in the crack size, the growth of the crack. Now, the piece of information that will help us eventually do that is this crack growth rate. The crack growth rate is the slope of that line. And I know that if I know the slope of a line at any point along the line, then for a given change along the x-axis, I can integrate that slope towards the change along the y-axis. So if I know the slope, provided I have a functional form for it, so alternatively present in the critical word is a model. If I have a model for the crack growth rate, I will be able to integrate it towards the change in the crack size. So you'll be able to, you can just ask me the number of cycles and I can tell you how much the crack has grown based on that knowledge. Okay. And we are going to make use of that crack growth rate. And again, let's keep in mind that the rate increases with increasing number of cycles. So now let's proceed a little bit further into the um, modeling aspects. So first, the first thing that we need to do is we need to introduce some terminology associated with cyclic uh, loading. So now this is going to be time. It could have been number of cycles. Let's presently just call it time and uh, it's eventually inconsequential. And this is the load. I'm using S again. Remember, it has to do with the gross uh, stress eventually because we're talking about a fracture. And uh, let us assume that the load variation is going to be between a maximum value and a minimum value, which is not necessarily going to be zero. So you can have a minimum value that is less than zero. So remember, if this were a tensile uh, loading, okay, if I pull, the crack opens. If I push, the crack will close. So ultimately, fracture should really not be of concern. But we are presently uh, introducing 
the, a negative, a possibly negative. It doesn't have to be positive, it, negative. It can also be over there, Esmin. But I'm just going to draw it as if it's negative. Um, we can imagine that the fact that it's negative, it's important. It closes the track. It closes the crack. But exactly how it's going to come into play is going to become apparent a little bit later. Um, so therefore, there will be a load variation. Let us assume that it is like this. So the exact nature of the variation is probably important. It can be sinusoidal. It can be triangular and so on. Um, we are omitting such details. Again, in practice, certainly the physics of crack growth is sensitive to the exact profile of the load. That's what it's called. So it could have been triangular. It can be, it can be spending more time near S max than near S min, so on. So we're just assuming a very uh, simple profile. But let me just note that it turns out that cracks can grow due to compressive effects. That's why, in fact, I have um, introduced a possible negative value. So that's the profile of the load. And um, here we have a number of important quantities that we should consider. One of them is delta S. Okay. Um, delta S is the change in the growth stress. It is, if you like, the range in the growth stress in our loading. Um, another quantity that we can introduce based on uh, the values of the stresses, it's R, which is the ratio of the minimum to the maximum stress. So that is, if you like, the stress ratio. Um, if it is zero, right, then it is zero to max loading. If it is minus one, the values under compression and tension, they will be equal in absolute value, but different in sign, etc. Um, if it is positive, assuming both S are positive, then the value of S min is above zero and it's closer to S max uh, than zero. Um, and eventually, if both of them increase a lot, both S min and X max, so in other words, you shift both of them simultaneously, preserving the range uh, of S, then R will ultimately approach one. Okay, so that's a simple parameter that helps us monitor the crack, the um, loading profile. So we have two important parameters, delta S, the range, and the ratio R. If you change delta S, the difference between the two lines will split, and the value of R will sort of tell us where, for a given delta S, this um, blue profile lies along the y-axis in some sense. Okay, so um, what we can define here immediately also is delta k, which is f times delta s root pi a. So this is very similar to the stress intensity factor. So omitting the delta, it's the definition of the stress intensity factor. Here, without saying, I'm going to assume that we have mode 1, so I'm not writing 1 explicitly. Um, so if you take the same equation and apply it with the range of the stress, you get the range in the stress intensity factor. Stress intensity range. Okay. Um, now, this clearly is equal to, let's write it explicitly by substituting the definition of delta s there. So first I will write it as k max minus k min, where k max is simply equal to f s max root pi a, and this is f s min root pi a. 
So for a given crack size, so I am in the process of loading the structure, there is a certain crack size. The crack will grow, but over a cycle its growth is negligible, so it's like a constant crack size. At the minimum load, let's say I'm bending the other way, S min is present, the minimum stress intensity factor is the value of the form factor for that given crack size, multiplying S min root pi A, and the uh, largest one is when I bend it back and try to open it, then it's going to be the same quantity but with S max, the same expression with S max. So when I take the difference, F is the same because over a single cycle crack growth is negligible, so root pi A is also the same, and S max minus S min is going to be delta S. So stress intensity range is the difference between the stress intensities at max and min stresses. So these are our definitions. We have the profile. I can control that profile either through S max or S min, or you give me delta S and R, uh, and I can control it. Either way, you have these two or these two parameters, which tell me a lot about the load profile. Not everything, though the exact profile I wouldn't be able to know. I am here assuming something like a sinusoidal uh, profile. Okay, so um, let me ask you a question at this stage, and you can think about it. The crack grows over time, right? Um, and on the other hand, the load is a constant. Delta S is not changing. So delta S is constant with time. The loading is given. It never changes. Does the stress intensity range change? Okay. So if you've thought about that question, uh, the answer is yes, it does change. The reason it changes is over time, at any given point in time, delta S does not change. Over a cycle, delta S is always the same. Here, there, and a million cycles later, we're going to have the same delta S. But the value of A keeps increasing. So although delta S is constant, delta K changes with time. Or changes with N, the number of cycles, even even if, let's say, delta S is constant. Um, okay, let's keep that in mind. And that is also an important information for us, an important simple observation. Now, let me also note at this stage that um, we are assuming a constant load profile. Delta S and S max, S min, their values eventually are never going to change. In practice, it could. It could start with some small variation, go up to a larger variation, go back to a smaller variation. So that is called variable amplitude loading. So not only the amplitude, the uh, the value through the center, the average value, if you like, which is S max plus min over 2, that also could change. So this thing could shift, the range could decrease, etc. So that is called variable amplitude loading. If there is variable amplitude loading, even for a given crack size, delta K, of course, over time would change significantly. Uh, but uh, that is a different discussion. In your book, there is a discussion of variable amplitude loading. If you're interested, you can certainly read it. We are go not going to cover it in class. We are going to look at constant amplitude loading, which is a constant load profile. All right, and now our goal is to answer the following question. For a given number of cycles, what is the change in the... Um, size of the crack. And we've discussed that the critical information to answer that question is a model for the crack growth rate. So I would like to have now a model, an equation that is able to give me four certain material parameters and loading parameters that are provided. I want to have DADM. Okay? Because if I know that value, I can integrate it for a given change in number of cycles towards the change in the crack size. So what is a model for DADM? Now I'd like to write an equation. And I like to write that equation in a form 
That is as simple as possible. And I would like to do so by keeping in mind that this quantity, this rate, has to do with crack growth, which ultimately has to do with fracture. So I probably would like to use fracture-related quantities. Now, first of all, uh, I know that the crack grows because I have cyclic loading. Now, therefore, you may think that, well, why don't I write the crack growth rate as a function of delta S? I'm going to write that slightly, not too bold, because I'm going to modify it shortly. So, because there is a delta S, there will be a crack growth rate. Now, I can make that equality, so certainly it's going to be proportional, because I can imagine that if the range is larger, I vary the stress more, then the crack growth rate might increase. That's certainly going to be true, and it is experimentally verified. So, the two sides are proportional. To make it an equality, I can put a constant, okay? And that constant now may depend on the material I'm looking at. So, this might be a material property. But now, is a linear relation between delta S and dA over dN a good idea? Well, maybe not. So, why don't I put some exponents in there so that I can adjust it so that we have a good fit between the experimental data for dA, dN and my model, which depends on delta S. So, here M as well is probably going to be a material property, if not more. Perhaps it depends on loading to a certain extent. But now, this is the simplest thing that I can do first, as a first step. Well, does it make sense? To a certain extent, it predicts that if there is no change in the load, there is no crack growth. Good. Uh, but it omits an important physics of the problem, which says that as time progresses, the crack growth rate increases. But delta S is a constant over time, and therefore the crack growth rate will not increase. This red line should have been replaced, according to that prediction, with a straight line, which is not what we observe experimentally. So, making um, the crack growth rate some function of the change in the load is certainly clever, but not directly of the change in the load. But now, remembering that I'm trying to model the physics of ultimate fracture, well, why don't I look at that quantity, delta K? So, that's another thing I can use. In fact, that's the next step I will do, because delta S already appears in there. Moreover, delta K has a very simple practical advantage. We know that it changes with n, even if delta S is a constant. In particular, the way that change occurs is that it increases, because with time, A is going to increase, so delta K is going to increase. So now, even if you have a constant amplitude loading, because the crack grows over time, delta K is going to grow, and the crack growth rate is also going to increase, which is exactly what we observe in the experiments. So this, therefore, by putting, making the proportionality and equality by putting a constant and then adjusting the equality by putting an exponent is the simplest thing you can do and someone has become famous for it. This is called the Paris equation. And the equation appears at first sight to be the simplest possible model which captures the physics of the problem. However, it turns out that it is heavily experimentally oriented. So, experimental observations actually do tell us that this is at least within a certain range of delta K, or for that matter, crack growth rate, it's a very, very good idea to proceed with. And that's what we are going to discuss in more detail next.